Uh, I'm Bruce Schneier. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any questions? <laughs> yeah. I'm serious. Look, if there are no questions, you're all going to get to go early. <laughs> all right, question over there. Oh. Um, I know we're going to get into uh, uh, questions on security. Uh, your expertise in uh, Two Fish, uh, the books you've written, uh, I, I and your abilities to securely erase a hard drive by shaking it by an etch sketch are all well known. <laughs> But I'd like to tap into uh, another, uh, another uh, realm of your expertise. Where can I go in Vegas to get a reasonably priced meal that's really, really good? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we, 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 we can do this. <laughs> So, so, so fundamentally, you've got you've got two dynamics going on. You've got the first dynamic, right, which is you know good, cheap, and fast. Pick any two. So, so you're going to have that problem. The other thing you have, and that's what makes Vegas interesting, is a lot of Vegas is subsidized by gamblers. Right? Go to places that want to have gamblers. Right? That's where they're going to get the food cheap because gamblers are subsidizing it. Right? This is a very weird economy here because stuff tends not to be normally priced. And, and, and you know, that's, I gave a talk a long time ago on hacking Las Vegas. And, and one of the ways to hack Vegas, one of, actually one of, the, your best, one of your best bets for value, bets is a bad word, uh, is sports book. Because you can go to one of those sports book rooms, bet on a football game, and basically drink for free for a couple of hours. Right? Because the turnover is so low. So for Vegas, you know, one, best way to win is not to play. Two, if you're going to play and you want to, you know, you want free drinks and play cheap, sports book is good. And three, if if you want to play and know you're going to lose and have fun, my advice has always been the craps table, because like unlike any other game, you're all in it together, right? You all win together, you all lose together. The pass line is one of the lowest house edges on the casino floor. Ignore all those other bets; they're scary, they're bad. You know enough math. So those are the places to go. You want good food at a reasonable price, you want to go places that incent people to come. The secondary casinos are desperate for people. Right? The top casinos don't need to offer discounts. Odd question, but I'll take it. <laughs> Hi, Bruce. My name's Damien. Hi. Uh, I was hoping you could talk about uh, the advancements by NIST in quantum computing and the risk to public key cryptography. All right, quantum computing is interesting. Quantum computing, it's... It, it's largely theoretical, right? We have a quantum computer we've built that factors 15, I believe. And maybe it's a little bit bigger now. But it, it is, it, it, there's, a, so there's a theoretical way of doing computing that's, that's non-Newtonian, where things happen in parallel. And, and the question you ask, the question you ask is, what the hell good's a quantum computer for? It's not actually good for a lot. But it turns out that the easiest thing a quantum computer can do is factor large numbers. And the second easiest thing it can do is discrete log problems. So basically, a quantum computer is a public key cryptography killer. Right? That's its, its core application. Against everything else, it's hard to tell what it can do. The, the, at a theoretical level, the maximum it can do is decrease the complexity of any computation by a factor of a square root. Effectively, that means in symmetric cryptography having the key. Right, so if you have a 128-bit key that's secure against all computers, which it is, someone invents a quantum computer, you need a 256-bit key to get the same level of security. So against symmetric cryptography, quantum computers are not an issue. Right, it's really easy to double a key length. Against public key cryptography, it is a huge big deal because it could make our basic public key algorithms obsolete. Right, it can make factoring easy. It can make it linear. Now, things aren't all bad. There are a number of public key algorithms uh, that use coding theory. Some of them have been in the 70s and 80s, a uh, little work in the 90s. Largely, they're only done by coding theorists and we cryptographers ignore them because it is so obscure and so inefficient compared to RSA or Diffie-Hellman that we don't need them. But they do exist and they would be secure against quantum computation as far as we know today. 
So when you look at quantum computers, I mean looking into, into the science fiction future, it does have the, uh, the potential of changing things but not all that much. It doesn't make secrecy go away. It doesn't make a cryptography go away. It doesn't even make public key cryptography go away. It makes certain algorithms go away and it makes certain algorithms insecure. And I think quantum compu computing is great. I, mean, I, I, I love the theory. But you know, is it going to be practical in our lifetimes? You know, it's hard to know. You know, right now there are some very, very severe limitations, like the like making the I/O work. But you know, we're really good at this. This, this is now turning into engineering. When we come back here in ten years, there might be a quantum computing room at DEF CON. That'd be kind of fun. I'm a college professor from Canada uh, and I teach a survey course in security to first year software engineering students. Uh, I use a lot of DEF CON videos and uh, a lot of the you know, expert uh, uh, content because they're not over the overly technical at this point. Uh, what advice would you have for me to try and what should I try and communicate to the students and what advice would you give to them seeing that they'll probably be seeing this talk on video in about uh, six months? You know, it's interesting. I, I think hackers are an extremely valuable part of society. And I, and I wrote an essay some years ago on, on the mindset of hacking. And I, I wonder if it's something that can be taught. Right? You can teach domain expertise. Right? I can teach networking. Right. I can teach lock picking. I can teach how airline security works. But the mindset of looking at systems in that certain sideways way, I think it is almost innate. The example I always love to use, I didn't, you haven't heard of uh, the Uncle Milton's ant farm? It still exists. I mean, it was around when I was a kid. And it's this little plastic, narrow thing, and you fill it with sand, and you, and you put ants in it, and you watch them dig tunnels. It's kind of cool. When you buy Uncle Milton's ant farm, which you can at any hobby store, it, comes with a, it doesn't come with ants, because that would be kind of weird. Right? It comes with a, a little certificate that you mail into the company, and they send you a tube of ants. Right? So the normal person looks at this and says, whoa, I can get a tube of ants. I look at this and say, you mean I can send a tube of ants to anybody I want? <laughs> What a great country. <laughs> and that's thinking like a hacker thinks. I mean, how can I take this system and make it do something that it's not supposed to do, that it's not intended to do, that the organizers didn't, the creators didn't envision it to do? And I think this is something you walk around the world doing. Now, I remember when I was a kid going into a voting booth with my mother, I mean, I'm, I'm yay tall. And I'm looking around and saying, yeah, I could cheat this machine. Right? You don't have to do it, but you have to think that way. So I like exercises that flex that muscle. Uh, uh, Yoshi Kono teaches a course in, in Hacking University of Washington. And he has his students kind of keep a blog together on hacking systems. And one of them writes a post on what it's like to return a car to Avis and ways you can hack that. And someone else is looking at you know, some, some other random commerce system. And, and, and it almost, almost doesn't matter what, right? And you know, how can you get more food at the Thanksgiving dinner table than you're supposed to? Just ways to think about how systems work, how they, how they fail, how they can be made to fail. And all else is domain expertise. And all else, and that's going to change. I mean, the talks we're seeing here at DEF CON this year are not the same types of talks we saw 15, 20 years ago. Right? The, the world's changing, but that way of thinking doesn't change. Right? The badges get weirder, but... <laughs> right? It's all about... I mean, and the badges are started out to be a little arms race between people who wanted to forge the badges and people who didn't want the badges forged. Now they've kind of taken a life of their own. So, you know, and I've written a couple essays on this, and I sort of urge, urge you to, to look at them and give them to your students. But, you know, thinking like a hacker, and, and it's a valuable tool for all life, not just for hacking, right? Advertising is hacking, politics is hacking, right? How can I subvert the system for my personal aim? 
And looking how to do that, I think, is interesting. All right, so as an aside, people who ask questions, you might notice you're being given an envelope. The envelope is, has my initials on it and has a number on it. Those of you who have one, save it. It will become valuable later. Those of you who don't might want to ask a question. I wanted to hear your thoughts on the TSA pat-down process and the potential for, us, for it to make us less safe. I'll give you a quick example. So when I opt out, I don't go through any scanner, not even a metal detector, and I'm walked past already pre-screened uh, flyers or passengers. So there's a the potential that I could drop something off or pass something off to an accomplice at that point uh, because the line is grayed between cleared and non-cleared passengers. And, and then once they impat it down, they often don't check the bottom of my feet and some other areas. It's funny. I've noticed this too. I don't know if people have. You know, right now when you go through the full body scanners, you're allowed to opt out. And I really recommend you all opt out. You know, not because the radiation is going to kill you, but because if we don't exercise our rights to opt out, we lose them. And, you, and I opt out, and I opt out not to have a private room. You're going to do this to me in public so people can watch. And he makes a really interesting point that I've noticed. So the way this works is you stand in front of the machine and the guy says go through and you say opt out. And you know, some, I've been told, it's never happened to me, that sometimes they ask you why and try to convince you to do it. They would never do that to me. They just say, okay. And they go in the little microphone and say, opt out mail. And then some guy comes and pats me down. And he's right. They don't send me through the metal detector. They take me around both machines, the full body scanner and the metal detector, and do a manual pat down, which for any of you in law enforcement knows is kind of a joke because any pat down that is not personally embarrassing is actually not very effective. And I have, I have asked TSA people and not gotten a good answer. Why when someone opts out, you don't send them through the metal detector and then pat them down? The metal detector is right there. It's being used. They're shutting people to A or B. And I don't have a good answer. And I think that, that does make you a lot less safe because it's really easy to send something through a pat down. I mean, so uh, I, the, the pass off scenario I think is going to be less likely. I mean, you got to rely on, you know, getting lucky and things moving at the right speed. And if, and if you get it wrong, now you've got the thing in your hand and that's kind of awkward. <laughs> but in general, I kind of think these measures are in the noise. You know, and you always see, I mean, we had, we had a newspaper story this week about some what, some 13 year old who got on a plane without a passport and without going through security in like Scotland or something. You know, those things don't really bother me because you can't build a plot around them because they're not reliable. I mean, right now we know that, I mean, we don't, we don't know the numbers, the ATS doesn't report them, but some percentage of guns get through airport security. Right? They run tests and airport security fails to catch some percentage of guns and some larger percentage of knives. Right? In a sense, that's okay because you can't build a plot. Now, compare I mean, a gun to a bottle of water. Right? If, if a TSA agent catches you with a gun, he's going to call the FBI and at the very least he's going to ruin your day. If the TSA agent catches you with a bottle of water, he tosses it in, in, a, in a trash and you go right through. What that means, even a reasonably good percentage of gun detection is enough to foil a gun plot, but anything less than 100% perfect water detection system is useless because you can keep trying until you get in. There's no penalty for failure in the water case as opposed to the gun case. Right, so I definitely agree with you that that's a very weird TSA procedure about not setting you through the metal detector when you opt for a pat down. But I'm not that concerned about it because of sort of the dynamics of the whole system. Hope I answered that question. That's actually an interesting one. Hi, Austin Holt. Uh, we met earlier. Hey. <laughs> I get earlier here. I don't know if you want to be like, I was, everyone was wanting their picture yeah. taken and we were going to do like no talks but just pictures. But that doesn't scale as well as this does. I've got a question about application security. So when we have commercial software or any type of product, I think it's important not to blindly trust the developer's claims that it works the way it's intended. They claim it to work for access control, any of the security functionality. Um, 
the current way that that's being done internationally is there's security evaluations that can be done on the software. Uh, the common criteria is the current international standard. OWASP has the application security verification standard. Uh, my specific question is more about the international standard that's used today, common criteria bet between countries. Do you have any recommendations uh, on how to improve the current system and make it better? I don't know. What are your thoughts? I mean, I think it's becoming worse. I mean, I think you said something very wrong in the beginning. You said that, you know, we're taught not to trust things and, and, and not to trust manufacturers' claims. Uh, we're stuck doing that. We actually have no choice but to trust manufacturers' claims. And, and it, you know, when I, when I started doing cryptography, I had some vision that we as a community or as individuals would analyze code ourselves and make sure it works and you know I've never done that ever you know sometimes it's claims of a someone I trust more I mean I know the people who wrote PGP and I tend to trust it more but generally operating systems uh, code even security code we are always we have no choice but the trust claims of vendors, of writers. I mean, I, I write something called Password Safe. I mean, I used to write it. Now it's now it's being written by uh, uh, Rory Shapiro, a uh, hacker in Israel. I'm trusting him. You're trusting him. You're trusting me. We're all trusting each other. Right? Well, as soon as society gets specialized, right, at a very real level, we have no choice but to trust each other. That's what my latest book's about. You know, I'm going to drink that bottle of water and I'm going to trust that it's not poisoned, even though uh, it's been opened. But I'm going to do it. And, and it's getting worse, right? In the beginning, we built, I mean, like the way beginning, we built our own hardware. Then we bought hardware and wrote our own software. Right? Then we bought, bought software and wrote our own applications on top of it. Then we bought applications. Right? Now we're in the cloud. We didn't actually own anything. Right? We're trusting at at such a huge level. My Gmail. Anyone have any freaking clue what operating system Facebook uses? Anybody care? Right, we have to trust it. So one of the ways we trust things are through these standards. Right? And the thought is that there are some independent verification or auditing and, and so common criteria is a standard, there are ISO standards, there are NIST cryptography standards. Right? You know, and, and we look at a product or a service and it has a bunch of buzzwords and we say, oh, those are good ones. And, and, and you know, in a sense, they're all sort of equally mediocre because all the standards ever do is secure the system against a known list of attacks. Right? Yes, it does this. Yes, it does that. Right? You can never have a standard of is it secure. You can have a standard of is it not insecure in this particular way. Right? But when you look at, at new attacks, new ways of thinking, new, new threat models. So, you know, I like standards, but I, I don't get too wrapped up in which one. Because what a standard does is it forces the vendor to have someone else pay attention. And that's generally good. So, you know, I don't know if it matters that much. I'd like a better answer. I mean, this is actually a tr truly hard problem. You know, I mean, but in this, is, this, is, this is, you know, computer science. We can't even prove programs terminate, right? Let alone, are they secure? I mean, all we can say is, and this isn't bad, right? I can't break it, and all those other smart people can't either and they've tried for a month. But we don't know what happens if they try for two months. Now, you all know this. This is, this is what hacking is about. And this is why a new person can go to an old problem and look at it in a new way and, 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 and figure out a way in. Thank you. Hi, Bruce. My name is Pete. I have a couple of TSA-related questions. First one is, it seems to me that forever the U.S. Congress has routinely exempted themselves from all the crap they pass on to us. Taxes, insider trading, healthcare, or whatever. But in this case, they're being subjected to the TSA pat-downs. There's a lot of YouTube and other traffic about very bad scenarios with congressmen. And I'm wondering, is that indicative that there's a new gang taking over or something? 
You know, I, it's interesting. I, I mean, pilots had this issue too. Right? I mean, and, and, and some very, uh, Patrick Smith, who writes the Ask the Pilot column, was very vocal about, you know, why are you screening pilots when they're controlling the airplanes? Aren't you? You're not thinking this through. <laughs> And, and I argue that actually he's not thinking it's true because the issue isn't screening pilots, the issue is screening people who have pilot IDs. So either, I have two choices, right? I either build an entire subsystem on pilot ID verification or I just freaking screen everybody. And, and I think the same kind of dynamic is working with, with, with Congress. I mean sure, you know, Obama doesn't get screened, he doesn't fly commercial. The, that it's just building in the exceptions was such a big thing and they, and they did airport security so fast. You know, if this becomes institutionalized, then you'll see, you know, fast lane. I mean, right now we have the TSA pre-check program. Right? I'm sure all of Congress is in pre-check. Right? You know, so those sorts of, of bypassing the line systems only happen after something becomes institutionalized. When it first showed up, it was, we need to do this quickly. So, so you didn't have that. But you know, it's an interesting point because you're right, they do exempt themselves. You know, and maybe it is that screening is just so quick. I mean, it's not like you know, taxes, which, which really you know, matter at, at some financial level, the, the way you know, pat-downs don't. Thank you. The other question is... Um, you don't get two envelopes, you know. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Hey, my name's Andrew. I had a couple of questions related to that um, age group of kids. I, th I think we learned you get one of them. <laughs> and, uh, well, I've got a 10 and a 14 year old and my brief story is, uh, you know, I sat down at my son's computer in the kitchen to, you know, check some news websites and his Skype logs open and I see the message, don't run this file, Josh. And, you know, there's a message that says, oh, Josh, while you were cleaning your room, I wrote this little batch file that would open up terminal windows until your computer ran out of resources, so don't run it. You might not know how to stop it. When I got home, I thought it was a bad idea, so I wanted to tell you don't run this file. So based on your research for Beyond Fear and your new book, too, and, you know, about self-regulating groups and how they, you know, self-enforce and things like that, I wondered if you'd comment on, you know, how that age group learns to be responsible with technology and things like that. So I, I, I have long said that the Internet's earlier is the, the biggest uh, generation gap since rock and roll. Uh, and, and fundamentally, the, the young people are the one. I mean, in any generation gap, the younger generation wins because the older generation dies. And whenever you see things like, you know, young people don't understand the internet, that's nonsense, right? I mean, they're the ones who are defining the internet. They're the, they're, they're the ones who create the internet. They're the ones who figure it out. It's the old people who don't. So, I, I, to me, young people have a much more intuitive grasp of the internet, of security, of, of the way things work in ways that we don't and ways that scare us. I mean, you think about, you know, the, the, I don't know, the, I don't know, the rock and roll, the generation gap. I mean, what did the old people say were the big problems, right? It was, you know, drugs and sex and, and, and you know, women forgetting their place and, and right, you know, death of marriage. They kind of pretty much nailed it. And that's actually what, it actually ended up being pretty good. So the young people tend to be right. The gr really good person, anyone has, has t especially teenagers, the ethnographer Dana Boyd, I truly recommend reading her stuff. She has a blog, she's written uh, papers and, and a number of her speeches are online about how young people use the internet and about how they assimilate. I mean, a lot of, I'm looking at this audience and, and you know, a lot of you guys know this, but your parents don't. And, and, and I think it really is, it's got to go the other way. I mean, I, I'm at a, go to a lot of computer security conferences where, you know, a bunch of industry people talk about how young people don't understand privacy. I mean, do you forget? Young people care a lot about privacy, right, from their parents, from their peers. <laughs> privacy is a huge deal when you're 16. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, people are still people. But the, int the intuitions are different. Because, and, and Richard Thiem talked about this an hour ago. People were at, at his talk. Right, the, the, the technology at which you come of age is the technology you find normal. 
and the technology you're good at. This whole nonsense about child predators. Kids know who, who, who adults are who pretend to be kids. They're not fooled. It's the congressmen who are fooled. Please. My question is, how do we secure those internet-based applications where authentication is critical, and what are your thoughts on cloud computing? Well, you know, I mean, the two answers, right, is one is we don't, and one is we, we, we do. I mean, <laughs> and, and we, right, we largely do, right? You know, internet banking works pretty much okay, right? It's not perfect, there are problems, but, you know, we're good at authenticating things where it does matter, right? Gaming works pretty much okay. Now, if any of you work for big companies, you probably have some kind of secure access token. That works pretty much okay. Uh, you know, there's, there's no magic bullet. Lots of ways we can do it better. We're always fighting usability. Right? Nobody wants to put their thumb on a device. Nobody wants to learn to play Guitar Hero, if people follow that news story from last week, <laughs> of implicit passwords. Right? I mean, you know, people just want to do their thing. And it's getting worse. And, and cloud computing is a really good example of this, right? Instead of my, my, my data on my device, my data is out there somewhere. But this is the future. You know, people who are, you know, you're talking about young people again, they are used to getting their content on the closest available screen. Right, at their house, at school, at their friend's house. Right? That's the way it's supposed to work. Right, people like it when they lose their iPhone they get a new one, push a button, and all their stuff magically appears on it. And, and again, if you start interviewing teenagers, they kind of don't really understand where their computer ends and the net begins. Because that boundary doesn't actually matter anymore. It's disappeared. And I think one of the, and actually, I'll sort of launch into this a little bit, I think one of the fundamental things going on in computing right now is this loss of control. Right, that we are losing control over the endpoints, right? I, don't have, I have no say in how, whether there's updates or not, basically. I have a Kindle that's even worse. Right, so I, I, mean, I, I can't even write a file erasure program for this thing because I can't get to the memory. Right, so we're losing control of our, of our endpoints and we're losing control of our data. You know, I run Eudora, but I'm a freak. Right? Everyone else is on Gmail. Right? Their mail is on Google servers. So suddenly my authentication, which was I put this in my pocket, right? and I'm the one who's touching it, basically, so I can get by with just a password, because it's a password plus the fact that I'm not going to lose it, or it's in my locked house, now becomes just a password. So you need more authentication. We're not getting it because usability people don't want it. And there are going to be a bunch of issues here. And the loss of control is a big deal other ways, right? Maybe it's being used. Third parties are getting access to it for advertising, for marketing, law enforcement. It goes across borders and then suddenly the NSA gets it and it's in a computer in Utah. I mean, all these things are, are happening because Giving up control is such a powerful consumer thing. I mean, people want that. My mother does not want her photos on her computer. She'll screw it up. She wants Flickr to have them. When her computer crashes, the photos are saved. It's a Christmas miracle. <laughs> and, I th and this is unfortunately, and I think it's unfortunate, this is gonna be a much harder future to secure. Because security is about control. And I talked about trust. Now we have to trust all these entities and you have no business relationship. Try calling Google customer service. <laughs> Actually, Google has great customer service. The problem is you're not customers. <laughs> right, become a Google customer, an advertiser, and they have customer service all over the place. So I mean, we're seeing these, these non-business relationships, this loss of control, all of which force more authentication, but you have the, the back push of, of users not wanting it. You know, I can't, you know, we've made some progress, right? The most common password is now password one instead of password. <laughs> but that took a decade. <laughs> Which means, you know, in 10 years, password one, two, three, four. <laughs> Where the A is an at sign because we're all speaking leet now, right? <laughs> 
this is a, this is stuff's hard. Please. Good morning, Bruce. Um, yesterday, General Alexander gave a presentation as far as building a better relationship between the hacker community and government agencies such as the NSA. I assume he didn't buy any of that, right? Well, <laughs> he failed, largely he failed to address a lot of the uh, issues with trust, which, as you know, is a huge factor as far as building uh, these relationships. How do you see the relationship bet between agencies such as the NSA and the hacker community, uh, community developing in the next? Ten. I don't know, it's, years. but it seems more like they lie to us and we more we and we buy it. I, I'm I'm not impressed. I, I didn't go, but someone said there's an NSA recruiting booth uh, in, in the in the uh, dealers area. They, uh, actually, the Enigma's cool. Go see it. I have the, the but so, and someone told me they actually Richard Theme told me this that they have a list of of attributes of the NSA uh, on their signage, and one of them is transparency. <laughs> Right, I mean, clearly we're inventing new meanings for words here. <laughs> and, and too much of Alexander's talk was like that. Uh, you know, the NSA needs hackers. I mean, the NSA were the original, huh? the, the, the original modern hackers. So they are going to be, you know, a, a, still a one-way conduit for information. I mean, they want everything we can do, they will give us nothing they can do. But, you know, this community is turning more and more legit. This is not the DEF CON of 15 years ago. It's really not. And so now, I mean, you have a place where the, you know, instead of spot the Fed, the Fed now puts a sign up. We're the Fed, come visit us. <laughs> right, and so, so, like the cryptography community, there is this, this information exchange that works one way. Now, in the 1990s, the NSA started coming to crypto and Eurocrypt. Now, Brian Snow was the first one to come, and he'd wear a badge that said NSA. Other people would come, and they'd have badges that say DOD or, you know, Fort Meade, Maryland. Or, you know, they, 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 would, they would, you know, obscure who they were, and they'd sit in the back and never ask questions. And presumably, right, I mean, they learned a lot from the academic community, but they never gave a paper. They never presented anything. So, and, and that's the relationship now, because now the NSA realizes is that so much of intelligence gathering is not crypto related. Right? That it's computer security, it's network security, it's hacking, it's physical. So you're gonna have this back and forth with no fourth. And that is the way it will be. I mean, we, you know, we're not going to ban them from coming because I think that's, that's wrong too. And, you know, they could always pretend they're from someplace else. But, you know, a lot more people here are legit than were 15 years ago. So I'll bet the NSA recruiting booth, you know, is pretty popular. And it's often that, sometimes they have cool swag, actually. So, you know, it might be worth seeing what they got. You probably can't take the Enigma machine unless you're really fast and get a distractor or maybe three of them. <laughs> so we should talk later. <laughs> that works. <laughs> All right, thanks, Bruce. Uh, this builds on a, the, a couple of questions ago um, with the Yahoo hacks and, and you know, the, the hack of the week, whatever, uh, that releases passwords and stuff. We, like you said, the, the passwords aren't getting that much better. Um, and I see when I try to talk to my not less technical friends and relatives that convincing them to, you know, do things like use different passwords on different sites and use more complex passwords and not click on that link from, you know, the guy who swears he's your buddy, uh, that, that it just becomes so complicated for non-technical users that they just kind of give up and don't care about any of it. Do you have any suggestions or, or ideas on how to make that? So I better? think this is a failure on our part. I mean, there's a whole lot of it in our industry blaming the user, right? The user chose a bad password, he deserved to get it. I think we in the community are failing because we are expecting the users to choose good passwords, and they can't, for all the, all the reasons you talked about. Right? They're not going to. And I think it's our job in security to make security systems that work with actual users, that educating the user is a mistake, I mean, think of automobiles, right? The first automobile was sold with a repair manual and a toolkit. But automobiles didn't really take off until, you know, my grandparents could buy one. 
right? Or in computers until my mother got a computer. My mother is never going to do anything. Right? The only reason antivirus is on our machine is I put it there. But that antivirus has to work magically without her knowing about it. I, even, I want to actually upstream in our ISP. Why in the world does she get malware and spam? It should be blocked at the ISP. You know, so I want us to build better security systems. Or, you know, and, and Microsoft's actually has some really good work now being done on, on security dialogues. And you know security dialogues, the dialogue comes up and says, you know, if you're a normal person it says, complicated technical gibberish, <laughs> make this button go away, yes, no. <laughs> right? That is a security warning to an average person. And whenever we do that, we are failing. Right? Unless we truly believe the user has a piece of information in order to decide which button to push, and we tell them, and Microsoft has some really good work on this, where they're trying to do this with dialogues. Here's a situation, here's what you know that we don't, here's why it matters, and here's what you should push depending on what information you know. That's a good dialogue box. Instead of, you know, I'm the programmer, I have no idea what you should do, I, I'm going uh, to give up and, and make the user decide because then it's not my fault. Right? So, so we, do, we need to get better. We need to get better at, at, at psychology of security. We need to get better at user interface. We need to get better at automatic security. I mean, spam is a really good success story. You know, anti-spam happens at the ISP largely, and I don't get any spam anymore, really. I, mean, I get, them, get almost nothing. I mean, and, and spam's an enormous amount of internet traffic. But it just works magically. My mother doesn't get spam, and there's nothing she did. I mean, that's good. That's what we want. The more we can do that, the better we'll do. Morning. Um, so I think one of the things that I find very useful about your writing is uh, analogies to bridging the non-technical and, and technical worlds. I love so, doing that. <laughs> so well, one thing that I, I wanted to ask about was BYOD and specifically you know, mobile device security. As, as you can see, there's many talks uh, around mobile security here. What are some useful analogies I can use to get across some of the risks to my senior management? You know, B and I think BYD is again this trend of loss of control. Right? BYD, I mean, people know this buzzword. It, it basically means your employer doesn't no longer gives you a computer and says, "Here's a thousand dollars, buy a computer." And you know why? Because you've already got a computer, you've already got a cell phone. You don't actually want the corporate stuff. It's more to carry, and it just annoys you. Right? But then once that happens, you get the loss of control. So, uh, so this is I think this, this is an important trend. This is a trend that is going to reduce security. A trend that's not going away. Because getting out of the provisioning business, I think, is, is, is valuable to companies. I mean, they don't actually want to give their employees cell phones. And, and you know, analogies, really think of it as loss of control. Because you know, now, as an employer, I no longer control that endpoint. It's very similar to home banking customers in some ways. Because you can imagine that banks could give each one of their customers uh, an iPad. You must bank through this, and I, can, and I control it, and I set the patch levels, and you can't do anything else on it, so I can make it secure. But instead, I say, you know, go to your browser and log in from anywhere. Right? But, but that's, and, that, and banking works that way. More and more of corporate IT is going to look like that. It's going to look like Facebook. Right? It's going to look like you log into a, this site. And, and, and the way that works, I mean, why banking works is you get a very, very limited number of things you can do. I mean, you don't log into your banking website and get a command line. That'd be cool. <laughs> right? You get a bunch of options. Same thing with Facebook. Same thing you know, with all of these sites. So I think we're going to see more of that less freeform, which is okay because most people don't need freeform. They want to do certain things. Right, they're going on. They're going on a court website to fill out forms, to get some stuff to read, to share documents, to send and receive messages. So think of it more as a social networking site, and that's what I think the effect of BYOD. All right, I'm gonna do, I think I'm gonna do quicker answers now because I'm running out of time, and no one asked me about uh, SHA three. What was wrong with you people? 
Hi, this question is about your book, Liars and Outliers, and with a reference to the previous panel, which was talking about philosophy, history, and politics, uh, which I'm thinking might be a trend now here that we're going to get into other things. So it says in your flyer that you quote Thoreau and Socrates, and uh, as a former graduate student in philosophy uh, and being familiar with Plato's Republic, one of the diatribes in the Republic is about people that are experts in other fields thinking they can do philosophy. So I was wondering if you could expound on whether you think it's appropriate, don't shoot the messenger, for uh, hackers to become uh, leading, leader, uh, thought leaders in other fields like yeah, philosophy. Yeah, hacking is not a domain, hacking is a mindset. 100% yes. Hacking is a way of thinking. Hacking is a way of looking at the world. You know, we tend to be hackers in computer science. We could just easily be hackers in biology. Right? We could be hackers in model trains, which original hackers were. So, so yes, simply because hacking is a way of thinking. Hacking actually is a philosophy. And, you know, and there are some things where, which can leach in other domains. Law is like that. Because law is a way of looking at the world. So lawyers often write about very different topics. So you get law professors and read law journals. They're writing about all sorts of things. Because it's a, economists also. It's a way of looking at the world. So in, in that we can bring our mindset to other problem spaces, I think it's valuable. What I try to do in my latest book is to go the other way. Right? To say, here is what philosophy and sociology and psychology have to teach us in computer security. Right? I'm not trying to go there and tell them their stuff. I'm trying to go there and say, what do you got that's useful for me in my field? And that was a really interesting thing to do. And I had a lot of fun writing this book. Because I'm trying to, you know, what, because security is fundamentally about people. It's about technology only a little bit. It's really about people. And lots of disciplines try in their own way to understand people. They do it differently. I, I started a workshop four years ago. It's called the uh, Workshop on Security Human Behavior. And the idea was to bring all of these different disciplines together who are working on the same sorts of problems from very different perspectives, have them talk to each other. And that was way cool interesting. Th thanks. Good answer, thanks. Dodge that one. <laughs> <laughs> Morning, Bruce. Um, my question to you is, uh, with the advent of social media um, and uh, how people are blogging and on Twitter, there seems to be a large percentage of people who have this sense of uh, futility and fatigue when working in the security industry. And I was wondering if uh, you felt that that contributed at all to actually solving some of the bigger challenges in the security industry. You know, I, I actually worry about fatigue also because it's so freaking hard. Especially when you're fighting, you know, uh, fighting for privacy, fighting for security. There's so many forces arrayed against it. I mean, these days, I worry less about the criminals and more about the legitimate forms, right? I mean, the corporations, the governments, who are using political and economic systems to force technological changes to make us less safe. And, and it is really easy to get discouraged. And, you know, I have no good answer for that. I mean, you know, we... And in, in so, sometimes the best we can do is lose slower. And, and there's, there's a quote that, that I, has sort of always stuck with me uh, by Martin Luther King Jr., who said once that the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. I mean, what he's saying is that in the short term, we can lose and lose big. Right? But 100 years ago, you know, half of us in this room couldn't vote. Right? 200 years ago, a bunch of us were slaves. Right, that history does get that we do improve, even though you, we, we hit you know, some local minimums that look pretty bad. So, I mean, that's, that's the advice I have for not losing heart. It's easy. I mean, luckily, you know, more and more of us come up right, and do things. So, so people get tired and can, can sort of sit back. But I've been feeling I've been writing the same essays for 20 years sometimes. I mean, I, CNN asked me to write about the Aurora shooting. What am I going to say? I flip back. I wrote a, a, a long essay about the, uh, the Fort Hood shooting. I said basically the same things about uh, what, whatever university shooting that was. Virginia Tech. Right? You know, so, 
I, mean, I, can re I can take the same essay, Cornell across to Virginia Tech and write Aurora Movie Theater. It's just as relevant, but I feel like I've said it already. Right? How do you, the problems don't change. Right? We're still fighting the same battles. And it seems like we have to win every time and the bad guys only have to win once. So no, this is hard. I mean, I mean, can't you ask an upbeat question, Gatsu? Sorry, Bruce. <laughs> So I have to end soon. Okay, you, uh, uh, so two minutes, so okay, yes or no questions, go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I will phrase it as a yes or no question. First, I was gonna ask you about what political hack we're missing, but since you said the solution is lose slower, uh, I've got the answer. Um, with regard to software, uh, it seems that uh, Chrome, for example, auto-updates and that it's been a very good thing for computer security. In general, um, I think a lot of people in this room probably opposed to software automatically updating and a lot of users are opposed to it because historically it broke functionality. So my question is, at this point in time, have we reached the point where effectively all software should update automatically based on a trust relationship? Yes. Thank you. Hang on, hang on. Okay. How many envelopes do you have left? No, 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 don't count them. Just, just, just take them and go back along the line and hand them out in order. Because I'm sorry. So, so a couple of things will happen now. I have, oh, here. So I should call this. I'm, I'm now going to a book signing. This is my book. Ta da. It's, it's available at the bookstore. And, and I'll be going there and doing a signing. I have this, which is the book flyer. It's kind of the thin version of the book. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't have as many words. But on the plus side, it's free, and I have piles there and there, so feel free to grab one. Uh, those of you who have cards, this is the galley of the book. Now, the, what a galley is, is before the book is published, the publisher uh, prints these and gives them to book reviewers, basically. So those of you with cards, if you come here, I will give you a galley. Uh, the galley has more typos than the real book, so you've got to sort of accept that. And uh, in return, I ask that you mention blog, tweet, anything, something that, that you read the book. I'd really appreciate that. So that's the plan for now. I'm going to go right here where this box is. And then I will go to the book. So I think I should stop at the Q&A area first and say hi. So I'll do that. So I'll do that for like 15 minutes. Then I'll go to the book signing. And then the rest of our day will continue and we'll all have fun. Thank you for coming. Thanks for coming to DEF CON. Uh, I'm Bruce Schneier. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah. I'm serious. Yeah. Look, if there are no questions, you're all going to get to go early. <laughs> all right. Question over there. Oh. I don't, I don't. Your abilities to securely erase a hard drive by shaking it by an etch a sketch are all well known. <laughs> but I'd like to tap into uh, another, uh, another uh, realm of your expertise. Where can I go in Vegas to get a reasonably priced meal that's really, really good? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we, 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 we can do this. So, so, so fundamentally you've got, you've got two dynamics going on. You've got the first dynamic, right, which is you know, good, cheap, and fast, pick any two. Hard to tell what it can do. The, the, at a theoretical level, the maximum it can do is decrease the complexity of any computation by a factor of a square root. Effectively that means in symmetric cryptography having the key. Right, so if you have 128-bit key that's secure against all computers, which it is. Someone invents a quantum computer, you need a 256-bit key to get the same level of security. So against symmetric cryptography, quantum computers are not an issue. Right? It's really easy to double a key length. Against public key cryptography, it is a huge big deal because it could make our basic public key algorithms obsolete. Right? It can make factoring easy. It can make it linear. 
Now, things aren't all bad. There are a number of public key algorithms uh, that use coding theory. Some of them been in the 70s and 80s, a uh, little work in the 90s. Largely, they're only done by coding theorists and we cryptographers ignore them because it is so obscure and so inefficient compared to RSA or Diffie-Hellman that we don't need them. But they do exist and they would be secure against quantum computation as far as we know today. So when you look at quantum computers, I mean looking into, into the science fiction future, it does have the, uh, the poo. <laughs> so, so you're going to have that problem. The other thing you have, that's what makes Vegas interesting, is a lot of Vegas is subsidized by gamblers. Right? Go to places that want to have gamblers. Right? That's where they're going to get the food cheap because gamblers are subsidizing it. This is a very weird economy here because stuff tends not to be normally priced. And, and, and you know, that's, I gave a talk a long time ago on hacking Las Vegas. And, and one of the ways to hack Vegas, one of, actually one of, the, your best, one of your best bets for value, bets is a bad word, uh, is sports book. Because you can go to one of those sports book rooms, bet on a football game, and basically drink for free for a couple of hours. Right, because the turnover is so low. So for Vegas, you know, one, best way to win is not to play. Two, if you're going to play and you, wanna, you, know, you want free drinks and play cheap, sports book is good. And three, if, if you want to play and know you're going to lose and have fun, my advice has always been the craps table. Because like, unlike any other game, you're all in it together. Right? You all win together, you all lose together potential of changing things, but not all that much. It doesn't make secrecy go away. It doesn't make a cryptography go away. It doesn't even make public key cryptography go away. It makes certain algorithms go away, and it makes certain algorithms insecure. And I think quantum comp computing is great. I, mean, I, I, I love the theory. But, you know, is it going to be practical in our lifetimes? You know, it's hard to know. You know, right now there are some very, very severe limitations like, the, like making the I.O. work. But, you know, we're really good at this. This, this is now turning into engineering. When we come back here in 10 years, there might be a quantum computing room at DEF CON. That'd be kind of fun. I'm a college professor from Canada uh, and I teach a survey course in security to first year software engineering students. Uh, I use a lot of DEF CON videos and uh, a lot of the you know, expert uh, uh, content because they're not over the overly technical at this point. Uh, what advice would you have for me to try and to, what should I try and communicate to the students and what advice would you give to them seeing that they'll probably be seeing the pass line is one of the lowest house edges on the casino floor. Ignore all those other bets, they're scary, they're bad, you know enough math. So those are the places to go. You want good food at a reasonable price, you want to go places that incent people to come. The secondary casinos are desperate for people. Right? The top casinos don't need to offer discounts. Odd question, but I'll take it. <laughs> uh, hi, Bruce. My name's Damien. Hi. Uh, I was hoping you could talk about uh, the advancements by NIST in quantum computing and the risk to public key cr cryptography. All right, quantum computing is interesting. Quantum computing, it's, it, it's largely theoretical, right? We have a quantum computer we've built that factors 15, I believe. And maybe it's a little bit bigger now. But it, it is, it, it, there's, a, so there's a theoretical way of doing computing that's, that's non-Newtonian, where things happen in parallel. And, and the question you ask, the question you ask is, what the hell good is a quantum computer for? It's not actually good for a lot. But it turns out that the easiest thing a quantum computer can do is factor large numbers. And the second easiest thing it can do is discrete log problems. So basically a quantum computer is a public key cryptography killer. Right? That's its, its core application. Against everything else, 